Today we continue the series on the doctrine of baptisms and in this current uh, section we're looking at the last out of the three baptisms which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit and um, in this subsection of that category we're looking at um, biblical examples given to us in the New Testament uh, pertaining to this particular baptism. The reason we do that is so that we can extrapolate from Scripture as to what we can expect with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, what is the New Testament pattern, uh, the scriptural pattern for being baptized in the Holy Spirit? And so in the previous uh, session, we had a look at the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and what took place with regards to the disciples when they were filled with the Holy Spirit on that day in the temple. And so today we're going to discuss the second account of this particular baptism given to us in Scripture and the passage of Scripture that we use as our text for today's discussion is in Acts chapter 8 verse 14 through to verse 24. Scripture says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart might, may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. And so this is, as we say, the second account of the saints being baptized in the Holy Spirit. The context of this account is that Philip the evangelist had gone down into Samaria and had preached the gospel to them. Um, and he had held numerous meetings of revival in that city. Um, and the Bible talks about the fact that many who were uh, demon-possessed had the demons cast out of them, and many lame were healed under his ministry. And the scripture also talks about the fact that multitudes were added to the kingdom of God under his ministry. Now, Philip, being an evangelist, would have had um, the working of miracles and gifts of healings operating through his ministry. Those are uh, two of the gifts that are allocated to the ministry gift of the evangelist. And Philip obviously operated in those particular giftings. Um, Philip, being an, uh, an evangelist who preached the gospel of salvation, obviously also then baptized all of his new converts in water. For the scripture says they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so that's the context of where we are at this, when we read this particular passage of scripture. Um, one more thing is that we find that even though all of these saints had committed themselves to the Lord, had all been born again, and they'd all been baptized in water. Some of them obviously had been healed, um, and some of them had obviously had demons cast out of them. Nevertheless, none of them had by this time been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So why is that? Why didn't Philip just go ahead and baptize his new converts in the Holy Spirit at the same time as he baptized them in water? Well, this kind of points us to the fact that there are certain giftings given to the body of Christ and the, the gift in that uh, Peter and John displayed on this occasion, the gift of being able to lay hands on the saints in order for them to be 
filled with the Holy Spirit, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, uh, didn't operate in Philip's ministry. And that's normal because uh, evangelists do not uh, normally have that particular gift operating in their, in their ministry. Uh, the gift of being able to lay hands on an individual to be filled with the Holy Spirit on a one-on-one -on -one basis, that's not a gifting, that's just operating by faith. But there are certain individuals in the body of Christ who are anointed by the Holy Spirit to be able to minister to multitudes. Just as Philip, as an evangelist, could get multitudes saved through the preaching of the gospel. That is not normal for all the saints to operate like that. It is really reserved for an evangelist and obviously the apostles' gift as well. Nevertheless, Philip gets all of these saints, these new converts, born again, and he gets them all baptized in water, but he does not lay hands on them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is that? It's because Philip recognizes that he doesn't have that particular anointing on his ministry. He doesn't have that gift to be able to lay hands on multitudes of individuals so that they could be filled with the Holy Spirit. Philip then sends to Jerusalem for help in this area. And when the saints in Jerusalem hear about Philip's uh, dilemma, they then dispatch to Samaria uh, the two apostles, Peter and John. Now, the reason they do that is because it, Peter and John are recognized in this area as having this particular anointing on their ministries. And when they lay hands on individuals, the individuals receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that's the context. Peter and John come down to Samaria. The whole a series of meetings for Philip and the new converts. And they explain to them what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about. They explain to them how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith. They explain to them that one of the evidences that they will see is that they will begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives them utterance. And then um, either Peter or John would have prayed a general prayer and the two, of those, the two apostles would then have walked among the crowd laying their hands on each individuals so that they could be baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the scripture brings Simon into this uh, account. Uh, we need to now understand the context of Simon. Simon is a, was a sorcerer. He practiced sorcery in the city of Samaria. He was very well known for that practice, had achieved a lot of fame and fortune through his operation in the supernatural. Obviously, the supernatural that Simon had been exposed to were demonic spirits. But nevertheless, he could entertain the crowds through his operating in the supernatural. And he built up uh, quite a good reputation, not, not a good reputation, a bad reputation, but never, uh, nevertheless a reputation in the city. So much so that people referred to him. He referred to himself as the great power of God. And everybody kind of believed that because he... He demonstrated supernatural um, events in his meetings. Now, don't forget, he's, he was an unbeliever at that stage. Philip comes down and Philip starts preaching the gospel as the evangelist. Um, Simon listens to Philip's message, sees um, Philip operating in the gifts of, the, of healings and working of miracles, in that si uh, Philip is now casting out demons, and having people healed, mainly lame people were healed under Philip's ministry. Simon is convinced about the gospel. And so he gets born again under Philip's ministry. And he carries on um, watching Philip. He goes, he, he continues with Philip, the Bible tells us, that he, he then attached himself to Philip as Philip continued his meetings in the city of Samaria. Now, we need to understand Simon's context, because don't forget, he, he Simon has uh, a, an understanding of the supernatural. He's comfortable in the supernatural. He's always worked in the supernatural, but he's worked with demonic spirits. This is something new to him. But what he sees is he sees Philip laying hands on both believers and unbelievers alike, and he's getting them healed, and he's getting demons cast out of them, because the gift of the working of miracles, the gifts of healings, um, is applicable to both saints and unbelievers as well. God uses 
uh, the, that particular gift in order to uh, demonstrate his power to the unbelievers so that they can believe the gospel and thus be born again. So Philip's operating in that uh, gifting. Simon watches that and Simon sees that. And so he's, he's recognizing, well, now that this is a different power. This is not the kind of power I've been exposed to. And he's very intrigued about it. Now what happens is Peter and John come down to Samaria. And they preach to the saints that they can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Simon is among the crowd. Simon is um, filled with the Holy Spirit on that occasion. Um, Peter, John, uh, either of them would have laid hands on Simon. Simon would have experienced the power of God coming upon him and would have begin to, begun to speak in other tongues as everybody else was. Um, and then Simon watches how Peter and John uh, go around the crowd, lay hands on the individuals and the, impart the Holy Spirit to them. When Simon sees that, the scripture says he offers Peter and John money because he says, I want the same gift that you guys have got. I want to be able to lay hands on people so that they can receive the Holy Spirit. Peter rebukes him very harshly when he does that. Um, so much so that Peter says, you really need to repent because you're on the point of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Simon backs off. He, he, he realizes he's really overstepped the mark and he asked Peter and John to pray for him. So, but getting back to the point as to why it is that Simon offers Peter and John money so that he can have the same gift that Peter and John are displaying. Well, the reason he does that is because, think about Simon's background. He's a sorcerer who, holds, who used to hold meetings of his own displaying demonic power. And people would come to his meetings and he would make money. Uh, he was quite wealthy through that. But now what had happened is he had subsequently switched sides because now he's in the kingdom of God. And so he no longer has access to demonic power anymore. But now he sees a new power that is available to the saints under the, in the kingdom of God. And he sees Peter and John laying hands on the saints so that they can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, where Simon kind of misses it is that he equates the power that Peter and John are imparting to the saints on the equivalent to what Philip was, uh, the power that Philip was using in healing um, people who were lame and casting out demons. Now, when Philip uses his gifts, he uses it on unbelievers and believers alike. Uh, he's not, uh, Peter's not uh, Philip is not saying, oh, you're a, uh, a believer, I'll then pray for you. If you're not a believer, I won't pray for you. No, uh, it's biblical for evangelists to lay hands on unbelievers as well, because God wants to demonstrate his power to them to bring them into the kingdom. So, Philip, uh, so Simon sees that. He then sees Peter and John lay hands on the saints so that they can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he equates this, this power to, similar, to the same power that Philip was displayed. He doesn't yet recognize that this power of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is only for the saints. He thinks he can use it as a crowd drawer and once again hold meetings displaying the supernatural just from a different source of power now. And so Peter has to address him on the issue. But the question is, why does Simon offer money to Peter and John to have the same ability? He says, I want to be able to do what you guys can do. I want to be able to go around, lay hands on people so that they can be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not because um, of speaking in other tongues. Don't forget, Simon is very exposed to the supernatural. He knows what attracts the crowds because people in the, in the natural are very uh, curious to be exposed to the supernatural. So Simon's built up his business along that line. He sees a new power being displayed and he thinks to himself, okay, well, I can't use the demonic powers anymore, but I can now use this power to attract people once again to my meetings and thus continue to make money. It would not be the ability to just speak in other tongues, a language that the recipient doesn't understand. 
Simon recognizes that no one's going to come to his meetings to receive a language they can't understand and it doesn't benefit them in any way that they can think of. Um, there's something else that Simon sees because Simon watches the re response and he experiences it, don't forget, because Peter or John laid hands on him and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so Simon recognizes that this power that is being imparted is um, something that he can use that would attract people from around the city to come to his meetings to be exposed to this power. So what does Simon see? Obviously, he sees what we discussed in the previous session um, with regards to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He sees this, the, the saints um, experiencing the power of God for the first time, beginning to tremble, beginning to laugh, beginning to weep, uh, as they are exposed to the tangible power of God, as Simon himself was in that meeting. And this is why Simon offers money to Peter and John. He wants that same ability. He recognizes a business opportunity here, and that's what he wants to um, capitalize on. Peter has to address him and address him very harshly because he's completely out of line, and Peter does. And Simon kind of repents, and we don't ever hear about Simon thereafter. It looks like he um, just becomes a normal disciple, and he doesn't, we don't know. There is speculation that he gets back into the occult and all that, but that again is just speculation. Scripturally speaking, he does ask Peter and John to pray for him that none of that which Peter has spoken about would happen to him. And so the point that we need to bring out, there's a number of points we can bring out on this issue. Uh, one is, is that everybody that Peter and John laid hands on received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. None were left out. Receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit took place subsequent to salvation and subsequent to being baptized in water because Philip had already got their people born again, had already baptized them in water and had then called for help from Jerusalem. The saints at Jerusalem sent him Peter and John. Peter and John laid hands on the saints that they may receive the Holy Spirit. And so we see in this instance, unlike the day of Pentecost, when the saints received the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit directly from heaven, in this instance, the saints received the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands of Peter and John. They laid hands physically on the saints and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, as a result of them receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, tangible power was imparted and the saints experienced the tangible power of God and reacted differently, obviously, Simon saw that and wanted to be able to do the same. And that's why he offered money in this area, because we've already covered the point. Um, and they would have all spoken in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this is the only account in the New Testament where tongues is not mentioned per se. All of the other accounts, as we go through them, mentions tongues as being the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It would have been exactly the same on this account as well. But it's important for us to understand all of the context in order for us to understand what really transpired on this occasion. And so that is now the second account that we have in Scripture of the saints being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, and we'll look at a few more accounts as we go through this series. We're going to end the teaching on that particular point today.